And to get started, welcome everybody. Welcome again. I appreciate y'all coming here. This really is empowering one another to help us aim towards that CRC certification. So just a couple of disclaimers here. I'm by myself. Um, I'm not CRC certified. That's why I'm doing a study group. Uh, I graduated in spring of 2023. Uh, this does not replace your own personal responsibility to study, of course. We're not associated with any particular education institution, organization, or anybody representing the Certified Rehabilitation Counseling Organizations. And with that, you get what you put into this. And of course, you are responsible for your own registrations and fees. Of course, we can give you the resources on how to do that via Emily. And of course, we can't guarantee you're going to pass the exam, but at least coming here, showing up, and getting a little bit out of it will help you get some motivated and maybe help learn and retain. And this is a very interactive group. As we've done the last three sessions, we're very talkful, we're very informative, and this is a great way to network too. So the person who was supposed to lecture today, uh, can anybody see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. yes. Yeah, I, can see see it. It. I can see it. All right. Uh, the person who was gonna be here to do it tonight could not make it. So fortunately, she made her presentation for us and she already recorded her voice. So uh, with that, as we go through the slides, if there's a talking point, you want to interrupt, you want to ask questions, please, 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 please ask questions, please interrupt. We would like to make this an open discussion so we can understand the information, learn more about this area, and of course, um, retain it for the upcoming exam. Without further ado, let me start playing it. And let me know if you hear it. Hi, guys. My name is Gabby, and I was a... Oh, shoot. What, what did I do? Oops. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, guys. My name is Gabby, and I was assigned crisis and trauma and counseling and intervention. I will begin now with um, a few of the objectives. The objectives. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Do you have a quick question actually while you're trying to okay. figure that out? Sure. Consist of understanding risk assessment and safety planning. What's up? Uh, I was curious if this would be um, available to us. Um, just, just, just because I like to follow along. But if if not, that's it's fine. I I don't want to I don't want to take you out of it. So if it's uh, not already was, shared with us, don't worry about it. She sent this to me like the last minute. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. it. Yep. Don't I'll even worry about that. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I'll forward you it, and it has a pre-recorded what she's talking about, and then that way you can still follow. Thanks, Kennedy. No problem. Understanding polytrauma injury. Define effective rehabilitation counseling services for those with polytrauma injuries. Understand the difference between crisis and disaster. Understanding the impact of crisis, disaster, and other trauma-causing events on individual and disabilities. Define the principles of crisis intervention for individuals with disabilities during crisis, disasters, and other traumatic causing events. Understanding the difference between emergency, disaster, and crisis. Understand emergency management systems in community and rehabilitation agencies. These are the objectives that we will be looking at. In risk assessment and safety planning, all this is referring to is a process whereby hazards and risk factors that may cause harm are identified, an assessment of the risks associated with the hazard is conducted, and a determination of the most appropriate ways to manage to eliminate the hazard. Risk assessment is vital in behavioral health, which, which the literature, if you read it, it will describe it as a protocol. What does that mean? It's important that there are steps taken to help determine what exactly the problem is. As counselors, we identify and assess what the risk factors are associated with the hazard and are in order to create a plan to eliminate. So what we're looking at is defining what the issue is so we can create a plan. We have to manage or minimize the hazard at most, so that's what the plan will consist of. 
This in turn will be the safety plan. We often think of a crisis as a broad scenario of a high school shooting or maybe our local El Paso massacre that happened a couple of years ago. What was the safety plan? This is a trauma that the individuals who encountered it in real life will have to live with forever. In our field, risk assessment refers to most often towards the goal of reducing suicide and homicide risk. When are risk assessment used? A mental health crisis is a situation in which a person's behavior puts them at risk of hurting themselves or others and or prevents them from being able to care for themselves function effectively in the community. They are the most often used during the mental health crisis. For example, you're at work and you notice a co-worker banging their head against their desk, crying. Here she is having a mental health crisis. Not only is your coworker clearly not doing something that is normal, but now is inflicting pain in themselves. What you want to do here is develop the safety plan to conduct clear, open-ended questions so that it allows, them, allows us as rehab counselors to get acquainted with what is going on. What are their thoughts? That's what we're looking at. Risk assessment for trauma. Risk assessment may also be used to determine the risk factor or the risk for trauma, I'm sorry. Trauma is a cognitive, emotional, and physical response to a powerfully charged negative event of, or series of events in which the individual perceives they or a loved one experience serious psychological, physical, or emotional harm. Take for example, a divorce. That can cause trauma. PTSD. The assessment typically includes an initial psychiatric triage. This process to determine A, the extent of initial impact of the crisis on the individual, B, the risk of experiencing trauma or re-traumatization, C, the risk of developing post-traumatic stress, PTSD, and or other behavioral health conditions, and lethality, lethality of suicide risk. I'm so sorry. Next, we're looking at assessments. With the assessments, we have two that we look at. We look at the formal and the informal. Formal risk assessment tools may also be used to explore, identify, describe, measure, classify, diagnose, and code behavioral health disorders and personal and environmental sort resources and barriers. Informal observational measures may be used to assess the individual's effective behavioral and cognitive functioning. The informal mentioned information in which is used to develop an, in, an appropriate and appropriate treatment plan, and I meant to say an appropriate treatment plan, that may also be used to make referrals to entities such as emergency inpatient hospitalization, outpatient treatment, individual counseling, and many other support groups. For those with a history of mental health crisis, safety plans or more formally legal psychiatric advanced directives known as PADs may also be completed by the individual and a professional during the time of psychiatric stabilization to determine a preferred plan for care during the future mental health crisis. So this initially what you want to focus on is the, um, the legal psychiatric advanced directives known as PADs because they're the ones who are going to be doing the um, the, the treatment plan, uh, preferred plan, something that is uh, a plan that's unique for each individual. Mm. Next, we're looking at assessments. With the assessments, we have two that we look at. We look at the formal and the informal. Formal risk assessment tools may also be used to explore, identify, describe, measure, classify, diagnose, and code behavioral health disorders and personal and environmental sort resources and barriers. Informal observational measures may be used to assess individuals' effective behavioral and cognitive functioning. 
The informal mentioned information in which is used to develop an in an appropriate and appropriate treatment plan and I meant to say an appropriate treatment plan that may also be used to make referrals to entities such as emergency inpatient hospitalization, outpatient treatment, individual counseling, and many other support groups. For those with a history of mental health crisis, safety plans or more formally legal psychiatric advance directives known as PADs may also be completed by the individual and a professional during the time of psychiatric stabilization to determine a preferred plan for care during the future mental health crisis. This is initially what you want to focus on is the, um, the legal psychiatric advance directives known as PADs because they're the ones who are going to be doing the, um, the, the treatment plan, uh, preferred plan, something that The, the treatment plan, uh, preferred plan, something that is uh, a plan that's unique for each individual. And if you want to stop and ask questions, I mean, we can sit here and discuss it together too, though. We can go through this quickly because we are going there pretty quickly. But if you want to ask a question or inquire about something or share about it, feel free. The trauma. Polytrauma is defined as two or more injuries to physical regions or organ systems, one of which may be life-threatening, resulting in physical, cognitive, psychological, or in physical, cognitive, psychological, or psychosocial impairments and functional disability. Rehabilitational counselors should be competent in facilita facilitating interdisciplinary care given to multiple medical and allied healthcare services for people with uh, polytrauma injuries. Uh, here, uh, specifically, rehabilitation counselors should be a core part of interdisciplinary team that includes physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, mental health providers, and other medical personnel. Uh, to name a few. Um, interdisciplinary competencies require strong responsive communication, understanding of medical and allied health, uh, and knowledge of larger health and behavioral health systems to which the individual is receiving services. This team um, are essential for a full understanding of the individual's functional limitations corresponding with work, um, school, any type of accommodations that need to be uh, created or done, assess, um, not really assessed, but um, I guess um, brought, brought to it the attention of the employer or even the school. Um, and inter an interdisciplinary approach is much more likely to identify appropriate work school accommodations as well as to facilitate more work, heartening and training activities. This type of collaboration may also reduce the length of the vocational rehabilitation process, which is ultimately our goal to have that uh, quality of life. Now we're going to start a video. Um, do not focus so much on the, on the, I guess, the promotion side of the, the video. Listen to what, what, the, uh, what the public servants have to say. Uh, I found it very interesting. Uh, they do define and go through a lot um, detail of the poly trauma and the way they work there. Um, stand by and watch. Thank you. My name is Pat Rudd. I'm the admissions clinical case manager at the Polytrauma. My name is Pat Rudd. I'm the admissions clinical case manager at the Polytrauma Rehab Facility here in Richmond, Virginia at the Richmond VA Medical Center. They define polytrauma as someone that has had a traumatic brain injury, as well as injuries to multiple organ systems. And that makes it a little different than your average 
um, motorcycle collision or car accident because you've not only damaged many organs and body parts, but you've also got internal damage from blast injuries, blast wave that goes through the body. So what we do is the active duty service members come into the military treatment facilities, they bring them into the U.S., and then after they're stable, they then call me and I assist with the transition from the Department of Defense to the VA for acute inpatient rehab. My name is Patricia Ekam, and I'm the nurse manager for Polytrauma 2B. Here in Polytrauma, we have, like the name said, Polytrauma, multiple trauma from injuries. Uh, we have from motor vehicle accident to bike accidents, some of them from brain tumors and other, we have those too. This unit is a multidisciplinary approach that we use to take care of the patient. We have physical therapy, occupational therapy, kinesiotherapy, speech therapy. Everybody works together as one big family, like we call the polytrauma family. And everybody comes together to ensure the patient gets their therapy needs met. Sometimes they come in not being able to do anything, they come in emerging from consciousness, like with the brain injury. Just emerging, they're not able to do anything, but they get up and do things for themselves. The ultimate goal is to get them to their best ability, what they can do, given their injury and all that. I don't know if you noticed, but in the hallway we have a big bell, and when the patients are discharged, they come down the hall with all their belongings and they're checking out and the staff gathers and they cheer and ring bells and clap and whoop and then the patient rings that bell and everybody's so excited. We originally thought we were doing this for the patient, but we realized we were doing it for ourselves. We've shed tears with them, we've um, cheered with them and to see them get to the point where it's time to leave, it's so gratifying for every member of the team so it's it's a big deal it it keeps us doing what we're doing choose va so when it comes to effective rehabilitation counseling services for uh people with polytrauma injuries. We, as mentioned before, we, uh, we as counselors work closely with the interdisciplinary team, which includes a variety of uh, public servants. I think I had mentioned some um, others would consist of uh, orthopedics, uh, psych psychologists. I know that when I worked alongside uh, Romp, I was dealing with a, uh, the actual doctor um, and uh, a doctor, which was the um, orthopedic, because um, I was dealing with uh, amputees. And we had also um, um, a PT. So there's a variety of people that assist and we come together to better suit the needs of our of our client, um, family, um, especially our care, the caregivers, making sure that you have that connection with them um, to obtain, you know, to obtain the better view of the client's needs and their progress. Rehabilitation counseling should provide uh, family members with local and online caregiving supports and resources that provide options for their their best, the best of care. So rehabilitation counselors may offer family interventions such as brain injury uh, family interventions known as uh, BI5. I wanna say that's how you pronounce it. The BI5 is a five session psychoeducation program designed to increase well-being, life satisfaction access to services and enhance family functioning for the person with brain injury in their family. Executive functioning skills are necessary for daily functioning and community So when our care, the caregivers, making sure that you have that connection with them um, to, obtain a, you know, to obtain the better view of the client's needs and their progress. Rehabilitation counseling should provide uh, family members with local and online caregiving supports and resources that provide options for their, their best, the best of care. So rehabilitation counselors may offer family interventions such as brain injury uh, family interventions known as uh, BI5. I want to say that's how you pronounce it. The BI5 is a five-session psychoeducation program designed to increase well-being, 
life satisfaction access to services and enhanced family functioning for the person with brain injury in their family. Executive functioning skills are necessary for daily functioning and community participation. Cognitive rem remediation services typically include exercises and skills uh, needed to restore functioning and assist individuals with developing um, compensatory and adapted strategies. So these are just like daily things that they need to know that we can assist with. Self-management support systems. Self-management involves learning and practicing daily life skills needed to increase functioning and participation. Um, Self-management skills to reduce the likelihood of developing a secondary health and behaviorally um, health conditions. For example, nutrition. Uh, Self-management support typically involves teaching skills, behaviors designed to increase medication and treatment adherence, making sure that they're taking their medications for one. I will be showing a video soon right now that's pretty interesting. Here's, here's a video that I hope you all enjoy. Some firefighters and first responders who raced to the burning towers on 9-11 or sifted through the rubble in the aftermath suffer trauma to this day. CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook on a program that's helped nearly... Some firefighters and first responders who raced to the burning towers on 9-11 or sifted through the rubble in the aftermath suffer trauma to this day. CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook on a program that's helped nearly 20,000 responders and survivors. Firefighter Brian Bonsignor spent six months working recovery at Ground Zero. His GPS unit marked the exact location of victims' remains. He would come home at the end of the day and you have the smell of death on you. Uh, your shoes, your pores, your skin, your hair. Bonsignor developed asthma and PTSD. 9-11 anniversaries trigger those PTSD symptoms. You become very sharp with people. You become very distant with people. I dealt with it by dissociating myself from it, from TVs, newspaper events. And if, if you relive it, it just piles on and piles on and piles on and piles on. Dr. Sandra Lowe directs mental health services for the World Trade Center Health Program at Mount Sinai. Some individuals are actually having what we call their anniversary reactions earlier than usual. For some people, it's because this anniversary happens to be coming in the context of a pandemic. So it's a confluence of events. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some patients started isolating more uh, during the pandemic and having a really hard time actually uh, mobilizing themselves. This 20th anniversary, coming on the heels of the pandemic, is even triggering first-time mental health issues. We had eight new patients coming in, and all of them needed uh, psychiatric treatment. For you, the memories are so vivid, but do you think for some others that the memories are fading too quickly and that they don't really I appreciate? Think so. and I think that it should be talked about, you know, what they did. They gave their life, not me. And honoring that sacrifice could be another path to healing. Dr. John LaPook, CBS News, New York. Understand the differences between emergency, disaster, and crisis. So we had already gone over disaster and crisis. Now we're just going to go over emergency. So for emergency, I put the picture of, um, you know, a car accident. Um, sometimes it's not as bad. I could become, you know, either or of a disaster or a crisis. But I put a, a car wreck. Um, it kind of looks like a rollover. Sorry. Disaster. I used a hurricane. Um, crisis. Uh, a death. Um, of a loved one. Crisis intervention is short-term care that occurs immediately 
uh, following a crisis, disaster, or any other trauma-causing event. The primary focus of a crisis intervention is to alleviate the immediate impact of the event on the individual and allow the individual in a crisis to function independently. More specific crisis intervention goals include A, relieving a crisis symptoms, B, restoring prior levels of functioning, C, identifying factors leading to the crisis, D, identifying and applying remedial measures, E, connecting current stressors with prior life experiences, F, developing adaptive coping strategies, and crisis intervention is grounded in eight principles. A, immediate intervention is essential because individuals cannot withstand crisis for long periods, and the intervention employed during a peak of crisis is more likely to be accepted. B, action is required to engage actively guide individuals resolving the crisis, mobilizing essential resources via agencies and support groups. C, setting limited goals that focus on those related to crisis situations. D, facilitating hope and the expectation that crisis will be resolved. E, resolve immediate problems. Um, and it gives um, emphasis on resolving problems underlying the crisis. G, protecting self-image to prevent feelings of inadequacy, shame, guilt, and H, fostering self-reliance through assessing the individual's coping skills and fostering their independence. Additional crisis intervention, uh, intervention principles recognized internationally as, internationally as framework for disaster include promoting a sense of safety, promoting calming, promoting sense of self-efficacy and community efficacy, promoting connectiveness and instilling hope. Finally, a detailed comprehensive review of crisis intervention principles based on recommendations from numerous experts panels provided as follows. I will be not be going through all these are too long, but um, you guys are more than welcome to read them. Um, give you a few seconds so you can read and and understand what the principles are. Um, I believe there is a question at the end regarding the the principles. So kind of, I think we're at a pretty good stopping point here. <laughs> Um, not to finish, but just curious, uh, what is your experience, um, you know, the audience here, <laughs> what is your experience as far as dealing with people with disabilities who are incurring some sort of disaster, or crisis, or trauma? That's a question. <clears throat> you asking us, Kennedy? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Hmm. Well, I, I guess mine could go hand in hand because I've worked with individuals that have traumatic brain injuries. <clears throat> and some of them are due from, you know, more injuries, bicycle injuries, you know, injuries and just different things like that. And like she said, what we were trying to do was put together an interdisciplinary team. And me with the CRC stuff and like the physical therapy, but a lot of times the physical takes precedence over you know, the mental situation, because they got to get them stable with that. But I mean, when you're dealing with something like that, it was, it was pretty, it was, it was pretty traumatic to me. Um, and everything like that. That's why when I transferred out of there and went on to working with children <laughs> with IEP and 504s, but it, it's, it's, it's really, really um, taxing to the soul just to get them, like she said, when they come in and a lot of times they're nonverbal and you're trying to get them to the point where they can benefit actually from therapy and some type of, you know, supportive services. So it's a big haul. And, and how she put this together is really, really good. So that's my little piece. Thank you for sharing. Does anybody else want to chime in? Put some thoughts and perspective in today with their own experiences? I'll go ahead and share mine. So before I even bothered thinking about going to school, <laughs> uh, for me growing up, um, it was 9-11 that motivated me to join the military, a lot of it. Uh, I deployed, I've been twice to war, and believe it or not, I actually worked in the medical field. So uh, with that, I wasn't a line medic per se, but I was a direct support and 
he will still call me doc. And um, we got to see a lot of the receiving end of the emergencies from the exploded IEDs to the disasters when um, either explosions are happening or natural disasters happening in Afghanistan and of course the loss of the loved ones. So, you know, working in the medical field, we were trained to respond to those types of disasters. But one thing we weren't, were never really trained on was how to deal with it afterwards. I think someone here mentioned that they were working with soldiers in the VA and I'm sure they've seen it that the one thing that the army or the military doesn't teach you to do is how to handle and get through those traumatic events so it no longer affects you so you can become desensitized and stable you know, to work and live. And we still live with a lot of guilt. There's the whole part of the uh, survivor's guilt. Um, if, you're, if your loved one died and you're the one that survived in, in a traumatic event, like why me or why them and not me? Uh, the other part of it is the just the reliving the trauma, smelling, seeing, and using the five senses of feeling certain things. And so there are some things even today that still trigger me. And I have to remind myself, like, I'm not at the war anymore. <laughs> that thing going on, nobody's trying to shoot me or something. And so I have to be a little conscious of my surroundings. I use, I use that grounding technique, is what they call it. Um, with that too, uh, I think that like maybe once I am working in a rehabilitation counseling field, I'm sure understanding, you know, what's the top priority of the client's needs after the physical is of course needs to be the mental, you know, but I take it a lot of times when it comes to people dealing with these, issues majority of the time they may be they may have multiple substances as well because they're using that to self-medicate from the pain i'm sure some of you can probably relate with that to a few of your clients and so you don't and i guess the key takeaway of my understanding here is um you don't really know what somebody's going through to actually get to understand a little bit in issues and then from there when they if they start opening it up it makes i think the treatment process easier but what do you all think about that I'd agree that it makes the treatment process easier. I would also say the uh, educating on how how the trauma impacts the individual, uh, both physically and mentally, um, is also extremely beneficial. I think that I think with understanding how trauma plays a role and how it affects you would possibly lead to an increase in being more open to discussing it. I agree, Andrew. Um, one of the things that I've, I've noticed when working with clients is actually admitting there was a trauma. Um, a lot of people, especially vets, don't even want to admit that they've, that they've gone through something that's, um, more mental and emotional than physical that is holding them back. They don't want to, um, and I speak from experience, um, it's almost like, it, it's a very bad sti sti stigma upon people and it's just getting them to want the help. That's a problem. I've had um, my brother-in-law, well, I guess you would, my sister-in-law's brother was in the towers when they fell. And um, she had three other brothers and herself. And um, the, the dynamics of the grief and the trauma was different between each one of them. And the oldest brother refused to grieve and refused to get any help and said he could get through with it. And another one of my personal experiences was with my dad, who was in um, the service, and he used to talk about the, the kids um, from Vietnam and what they were going through and how the physical wasn't so much as bad as the mental. He had a lot of friends who were in Vietnam. So that's another reason why I do what I do. I did I make any sense? No, no, you did. I want to say thank you both for sharing and putting in on that. So, like, I wonder, you know, something I just, just me here thinking, you know, I wonder about the next generation that's coming up. A lot of them that are still 10, 11 years old, what is going to be their 
crisis traumas that we as a rehabilitation counselor might have to address. Because I noticed the big thing now is the whole social media um, aspect, you know, the nonverbal sending death threats to somebody who's a popular on TikTok or Facebook and people are jealous. And I'm like, do we now consider that as trauma now? Would I think be trauma, business? yeah, I, I, I understand. I think trauma is anything that affects you in a way that's going to, to cause you any kind of a mental, physical, or emotional harm. I think that the generations, the next generations that are coming up are going to be much more palatable or willing to get the help that they need and admit there's help rather than it being, you know, shoved away. I mean, my generation, there was no such thing as mental health issues. You know, you, if you had a substance abuse issue, you were, you were considered weak and no good. You know, all of these things have transpired over the decades to a better understanding. So I think the next generation is going to be better at getting healthier quicker because they're going to be much more willing to get the help that they need. You know, you've got to want it in order to get better. And I think that's one of the biggest barriers when working with anybody in trauma or any kind of mental health and or emotional health. They have to want it. Or they're not like you motivational interviewing <laughs> Kennedy there you go of course you want to get them today you want to at least guide them into that point all right and thank you for sharing so I think this is also going to tie into this next section here so I'm going to go ahead and play it thanks for the conversation I appreciate it So finally, we come to uh, the last objective emergency management systems and community and rehabilitation agencies what we're looking at here is uh, shelters, you know, food pantry services, educating the community, most importantly than anything, educating your client. Rehabilitation counselors must understand the emergency management systems in their communities and within the rehabilitation and allied health organizations. Emergency uh, management systems are typically statewide and are coordinated with local municipalities, counties, and cities. These systems are immediately enacted in the case of a local county city state or national emergency emergency management systems are coordinated plans that outline strategies for communication the resources needed the personal involved the personnel involved and plans for recovery ideally these systems are developed in collaboration with local communities entities to ensure that all people particularly the vulnerable at risk communities are protected i like to mention fema Communication strategies may include media, phone, internet-based um, alerts, and emergency updates communicated through the government. First responders attend those who are being immediately um, affected to the emergency. Those are also somebody to think about. Um, you know, they help in the evacuating whole, um, people from their um, fire in their homes, hurricanes, protecting schools and other entities from sh an active shooter, etc. First responders may also include trauma response teams and personnel from organizations that provide food, basic resources, shelter for those who are removed from immediate danger or a threat. You know, a state assistive uh, living center is one of them. You know, also it's a shelter that you can go to um, and it's here locally. Importantly, organization specific plans should be developed within the context of the larger community emergency management system to ensure appropriate coordination of actions and resources. An example, again, like I mentioned was FEMA, whole community model of emergency management that seeks to engage a broad spectrum of community partners in a particular geographical area, including the public, private businesses, nonprofit organizations, to collaborate with local tribal, state, territorial, and federal government partners in developing a community driven emergency management system that prevents, protects, against, mitigates, responds to, recovers from any type of emergency effectively. So um, again, the whole community model of emergency management that is what um, seeks to engage the broad spectrum with community partners. Um, keep that in mind, the whole community model is, um, is one of the approach by, FEMA's, by FEMA. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed and learned a little bit of something here with about uh, crisis and trauma counseling and intervention. 
Um, I have some questions to ask, of course, as usual, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.